If the United States or any other country is ever to be transformed, Dr. Deming said one of the things that had to be done was improvement of the educational system, and the Deming method would do that. First, we will see a short excerpt of a tape about an inner-city New York high school trying to improve itself while its budget is being cut and all around its social conditions are deteriorating. Most of our students are first-generation high school graduates. Most come from single-parent families. 876 of the 1,759 were on free or reduced lunch, which is poverty level. Any student who files an application to Westinghouse is a student who can get into Westinghouse. Under the conditions we face with an inner city school with youngsters who, who come to our school from neighborhoods in which there's gunfire every night, um, in which we attend uh, funerals all the time because our youngsters are killed um, in the neighborhoods, if we can succeed here, uh, it can be done all over America. The process which we have followed at Westinghouse is uh, commitment by leadership to change. Utilizing the tools of quality, coming up with a vision, a mission. We then have been able to, forward, by using data uh, and facts, been able to move the, the process forward. We had the faculty make a list of the reasons they came into education. And the number one reason was because they wanted to help children. They thought they could make a difference. They said, it's the attitude, you gotta change that. And so we changed the attitude in this building, the school tone. We said, okay, you can't wear hats, you can't wear radios uh, in school. This is an educational institution. It's a serious place of learning. And so the school's a serious place. School tone changes. Uh, that affects everything. There's not one thing. It is all incremental. It's, it's part of a continuous improvement process. It's an ongoing thing of changing a school's culture. The traditional school for me was the one where the teachers knew best and they told us parents what the kids should do. A quality school for me is one where the parents come in, they hear what the school is offering, but they can give input into the educational schema and know that some of what they say, not everything, that some of what they're saying will be changed and be put into the curriculum so that it helps the youngsters to make more sense of their education. And that's what we have here. It used to be that I would come in on the first day and tell students you're having an exam every two weeks, you have homework every day and it's due tomorrow, and I laid down the law. And now instead the first two days are spent, how would you like your grade developed? And my students this semester have decided that attendance should be more important than, uh, than exam grades. They also decided that they want an exam every two weeks. They also decided that they want a quiz every Tuesday. So it's totally driven by them, which is, is new for me, but it's also exciting because now they want to do it. They want to do this work. What we're doing here at Westinghouse uh, can be done at other schools. Um, if you can do it, and if you can make it in New York City, you can make it anyways. Well, Claire, I spent two days there, and I met with a lot of teachers, a lot of students, and I'm very much impressed with what they've done, especially when I take into account the terrible situation they're in. The building is dilapidated. I've never been in an inner city school uh, where you have to go through the metal detectors to get in and uh, it, it's kind of like uh, some of the worst things you see on TV. Uh, I spent the first day talking with a number of teachers about how they were doing in quality and what they uh, were trying to do and how it went. And I also discussed with them some techniques that I've learned uh, working with David Langford on how to get the students and teachers to work together towards their objectives instead of the typical adversarial relationship. That was on Monday and on Tuesday I went to classes and I went to uh, one of the classes, in fact, Miss Beneke that you saw on the tape. I went into her class and sat in the back of the room. When she saw me, she stopped and she said to the students, well, yesterday Dr. Tribus taught me something. I'm going to try it on you. So she started to elicit from the students what, they, uh, what would make for a good class experience. And they'd never done that before and she'd never done it before and it bogged down, it didn't get anywhere. And then she stopped and she looked at me and she says, Dr. Tribus, will you take over and show me how to do it? Now, I've never taught in high school, let alone an inner city school. And as soon as I started to talk to these youngsters, I saw that wasn't going to work. 
So I said, well, let's stop. This isn't working. Everybody put your head on the desk, close your eyes, and for two minutes, go to sleep if you can. So after two minutes, I then said to the students, look, here's what we're going to do. You tell me all the things that this teacher here has to do so that within 10 days, you'll be seeking out your nearest mafia contact and letting out a contract on her. And when I did that, the ideas flew. They had all kinds of proposals, and I put them all together in a fishbone diagram, putting it on the board, and that's one of the techniques. You, you don't tell people, I'm gonna teach you this, you just do it. It becomes obvious what you're doing. Well, you know, then we decided, after we had a number of suggestions on the board, what, you know, we had to ask, what are you going to do, what is she gonna do, so none of these bad things happen? And we started discussing how they would work together to at least avoid having life be hell in the class. And it really took off. They were enthusiastic, they participated, and the bell rang. And one of the proudest things for me is one of the kids said, when you coming back? Right? Now, I did interview, uh, I think it was 11 students who had studied with Franklin Chargill, and I found them to be magnificent. You see, these kids not only had understood about quality, they were street smart. They understood New York better than I do, certainly. They understood the political scene. They understood what they could do. They understood how to survive when things aren't all in your favor and the role of quality in it. And I was impressed, enormously impressed. Frank has a book out now. I recommend everybody read it. It uh, is an honest book. It portrays the situation as it really is. We'll talk uh, more about uh, Westinghouse after we look at another school far different than Westinghouse Academy. This is Cedarcrest Academy, a private day school in Clarkston, Michigan. Dr. Deming spoke at its dedication uh, 10 years ago last, I think it was last Thursday, or last Wednesday. Uh, let's roll Good time. Job there, Aaron. Good job. The idea is to go from what the child needs, what the child has, what the child comes into the setting with, and go from that point on the journey of education and learning processes, and to develop uh, an opportunity for enhancing that inner passion and that inner motivation that they already have naturally. The main focus of the school is the student. Um, and that everything has to work around the, that specific child's academic needs, psychological needs, biological needs, physiological needs, the, the gambit of, of everything that they're going to need to develop and, develop and grow. And it's different in that um, it listens to the child as opposed to the system dictating to the child. The child is the system. Now children are asking questions and are allowed to ask questions and say, no, I don't agree with that, and disagree with the teacher, and have a dialogue going back and forth. That, that would never have happened when I was in school. Never. I mean, that was just a very, it was a very pleasant, calm, quiet, regulated kind of a day. day. It wasn't... There was no risk taking it on. We have an organic structure, which means that it's created as we go along. And I'm a partner in that, the students are a partner in that, and uh, the administrators are partners in that. And sometimes that may mean that you go, oh, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do, and you have to figure that out because it is being created as we go along. I think we have extremely high expectations of everyone involved, of um, the administration, of teachers, of students. We expect them to do their best um, and to continually improve on what their best is. I've changed in that I'm constantly aware that I'm also a learner and that students have a lot to teach me. <laughs> Betty Moen is a founder of Cedar Crest Academy. You saw her on the tape. Uh, this is a private school, Betty. Now, can you really do this kind of education in public schools? Educators at Cedar Crest Academy in the whole United States must know their purpose 
And all of us as educators must create an environment to promote the desire to learn and to mature. Developing the whole mind, developing children's character, developing their selfhood is the greatest purpose there is. Well, that can be done anywhere. It can be done anywhere. If it can be done anywhere, then why isn't it being done in the public schools of the United States? Myron? Well, in the first place, it is being done in a number of places. Uh, one of the leaders in this has been the Mount Edgecombe High School in Sitka, Alaska, where, where it was extraordinary. In fact, I have to say, that's where I learned how it can be done. But uh, the American As Association of School Administrators has maybe 500 schools across the United States involved in a network where they discuss how they're doing it. So the answer is, people are trying, people are learning. Uh, it's a, a new path for them, so the learning isn't as fast as you'd like. Um, I guess we have to ask a different question, namely, what holds us back? And uh, recently, uh, David Langford and I prepared a paper called The Barriers to Quality Are at the Top. See, the people who head up education today are people who grew up in the old paradigm, and they don't yet understand that they must change. Now, we're just beginning to see this uh, woman running for superintendent of uh, schools in the state of California, is talking openly about bringing Deming into the schools, and uh, recent superintendents uh, uh, appointed in uh, my hometown of Fremont has talked very strongly about this. Uh, so it is happening. It's much too slow, but it is happening. Here's a, a question on this uh, uh, from Mary Ellis in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Tulsa Tech Center. Wants to t have you tell us about, uh, Betty, about the integration of Deming philosophy in an educational setting. What suggestions do you have for implementation? I think that um, Deming worked with us in regard to understanding variation. I think variability in students is as profound as it gets. And um, that is absolutely critical to meeting the needs of each learner in an environment. So integration of systems thinking and certainly theory of variation is absolutely imperative to learn uh, before you can uh, take that into the curriculum that you already know. Well, when you started your school, how did you begin to do this with your teachers and the parents? Through staff development, first of all, uh, working with staff. And a lot of my teachers even tell me this, that a lot of the importance was me going into the classroom with them and modeling um, the management with students and learners and getting involved, just as we did on the tape there for a moment. And you saw in my science class uh, that day, uh, that kind of dialogue with me, with the teacher, and with students. And I did that in classrooms, and I do that every day in classrooms with teachers. And they're not intimidated about that. They're open, and they, in fact, they really love it. They want me to come more often. I, I think uh, uh, what you said is right on the mark. I think there's some additional things that we want to take into account. Um, people don't have a clear idea of what to expect from education. And I think this has to be worked out. I, I propose that we look at what goes on in the schools under four categories. There's the provision of knowledge, which helps you to understand. There's the development of know-how, which enables you to actually do something. Then there is the development of wisdom, which I define as being able to set priorities, to tell what is important from what is not, and to be on top of your own thinking process so you're not just reacting to the world around you. And fourth is the development of character, the things that make us human. Teachers want to do those things, but standardized tests and various forms of administration, particularly those that look at the scores of students and judge only on that, tend to drive this out. So that's the first part. The second part is to recognize that the product of a school is not the student, it's the education of the student. And the education of the student has many potential customers. And if you talk to those customers, you will discover that they generally agree. Now where the student has a strong voice is in the process of learning. And here I have to say that there are not enough people who concentrate on learning. They talk a lot about teaching. And I have to tell you this little story. David Langford has used this many times. He said, last Wednesday I taught my dog to whistle. He says, really did. I taught my dog to whistle. I worked hard at it, I studied, and I taught. He didn't learn, but I taught. <laughs> and the problem with improving teaching is it is not focused on learning. 
And today we have the works of Reuven Feuerstein of Israel, who has given us enormously important insights into the problems of learners. And I think when we combine what Deming has to say with what Reuven Feuerstein has to say, then we'll have quality education. Do you have a quick? Any system has to be very passionate about learning itself, and then passionate about the young learner. And without that, Bravo. 